During the First World War, he, in 1916, he was visited by a bedraggled soldier. Marsh, from, he claimed for weeks to visit the great teacher of mysticism, Martin Buber. He knocked on the door at 6 o'clock in the morning, and he said, I have to speak to you. But we said, well, it's early. But we didn't realize the man was in, in great stress. And he said, well, come in. I, and then the man asked questions. And Bubba said he cordially responded to each of the questions. And the following day, he learned that the man had committed suicide. Mm. Because he failed to see the questions that were really inscribed in, in the furrows of his forehead, mm. as opposed to simply being spoken. Professor Paul Mendes Flohr is a leading scholar of modern Jewish thought. He has written some 30 books, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, 40, and edited another 45, authored some 300 articles and papers on modern Jewish intellectual history, philosophy, and religious thought, with a focus on the lives and the ideas of the leading German Jewish intellectuals of the 19th and 20th centuries, including Martin Buber, Franz Rosenzweig, Gershon Schollem, and Leo Strauss. So far, so far correct? More or less. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> Professor... Paul Mendes is the Professor Emeritus of Jewish Thought at Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Professor Emeritus of Modern Jewish Thought and History at the University of Chicago, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a Senior Research Fellow at the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem, where we are currently being hosted graciously, and was the Director of the Franz Rosenzweig Mavera Research Center and is the Editor-in-Chief of the 22-volume German edition of the Collected Works of Martin Buber, as well as a series on German Jewish literature and cultural history. True as well. <laughs> Some of the professor's recent works include Gustav Landauer, Anarchist and Jew, which from 2014, Dialogue is a Transdisciplinary Concept, 2015, and in 2019, the professor published a biography of Martin Buber, which was entitled Martin Buber, A Life of Faith and Dissent. In his most recent work, Cultural Disjunctions um, Post-Traditional Jewish Identities, Professor Mendes Flohr explores the possibility of a contemporary, spiritually, and intellectually engaged cosmopolitan Jewish identity and walks us through the labyrinth of 20th century Jewish cultural identities and commitments and calls for Jews to remain discontent, not just with themselves, but also with the reigning social and political order to fight for its betterment. Now that we've gotten all the technicalities away, we can, we can speak. No, <laughs> so at the channel here at Seekers of Unity, we are very interested in approaching mysticism from a historically and academically and intellectually rigorous way, but in a way that's also meaningful to people living their lives and not simply a matter of academic interest or, or a hobby. And you, over the long course of your career, have studied many of the great modern Jewish thinkers, and much of their thought, as far as it seems, overlaps with mysticism. And I'd be curious to know in the large swath of the movement of thought, which is something that you have been studying, why do we see this upsurge or this intake in mysticism in thinkers like Buber, perhaps in some of the other characters that you've, that you've studied as well? Where is this coming to them? And why, why, are they, why is it an interesting subject for them? All right. I'm going to perhaps, uh, if I can use such a term, give a dialectical spin to the question. And I'll focus on Martin Buber. Um, why Buber? Is, I'm a, because I've devoted much of my life to his thought. But we're about to celebrate the 100th anniversary of his monumental book, High and Thou. Mm. Um, it was published 100 years ago in early 1923. Less than a few months, a few months hence, we will be noting that event. Um, what is significant about Buber is that he um, had initially engaged in, in what we refer to as the mystical experience. And then as he matured, as he understood the maturing, as he, at least he's, he's aged, we'll say, I mean, maturing is a, is a judgment, but he would say matured. Um, he had certain reservations on a specific, specific conception of the mystical experience. As a young man, um, he was drawn to mysticism in general, and particularly Jewish mysticism, as manifest or expressed in Hasidism. At that stage, when he was a young man and, and shared much of the concerns of his generation, was somehow to flee a very troubling uh, society, a world where relationships were broke down or 
developed by crass, pragmatic uh, considerations uh, in German thought, and this enters to our vocabulary, at least amongst the intellectuals, uh, a distinction between traditional society, which was called Gemeinschaft, where there was an implicit uh, solidarity, self-understanding uh, of one's relationship to others. Um, as we transition from traditional society to modern urban civilization, our relationships are more, far more calculated by personal advantage, what some people would call instrumental reason, how I can further my own interests, my own um, professional as well as economic interests. Um, and, one, and that rendered read read relationships um, pragmatic mm. or even fraught by a certain amount of uh, what we call estrangement, mutual estrangement. Um, and implicit solidarity, which apparently characterized traditional society. So there's a turn to mysticism beyond the fractured reality of, that we, that characteristic, this transition to modern life, mm. uh, to bring us to a higher reality. Um, that, of course, we can express that in philosophical language, but that was a general thrust, and Buber participated in that um, quest with a generation. Um, he gave it both expression in his in general considerations of mysticism, the book that gained the most uh, um, status within that culture, cultural ambiance, was a collection of ecstatic confessions in 19, 1909. And he collected there ecstatic confessions from uh, theistic mystics, Jewish, Christian, and uh, uh, Islamic, as well as pagan, so-called pagan. One of the great attributes, at least from the perspective of our generation, is he was one of the first to include women mystics within this collection. Um, and it was a, a book that was cited by many. Somebody did a dissertation on a, a novelist, a very important novelist called Robin Lucille, a strange German in dissertation. He quoted ecstatic confessions, according to this research, 293 times. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, one would do that today. What one learns from that, I'm not certain, but nonetheless, it was one, a book that made a great impression. And he continued um, to, to publish on mystical and mythic literature and great fame. Then he tells the following story. During the First World War, he, in 1916, he was visited by a bedraggled soldier. Marsh from his claim for weeks to visit the great teacher of mysticism, Martin Buber. Uh, he knocked on the door at six o'clock in the morning when Buber was already at his study. And yes, don't do that, obviously. Uh, certainly in Germany, where everything is very formal. And he said, I have to speak to you. Buber said, well, it's early. But Buber didn't realize the man was in, in great stress. And he said, well, come in. I, I'll, perhaps we can have a half hour discussion. And the man asked questions. And Buber said he cordially responded to each of the questions. And the following day, he learned that the man had committed suicide. Mm. Because he failed to see the questions that were really inscribed in, in the furrows of his forehead, mm. as opposed to simply being spoken. Uh, and he realized that the mysticism which takes us out of the, the troubled world we live in. We somehow neglect the, the troubles that really characterize that world. Mm. So he went through a process of reconsidering the mystical, um, at least to ground it in what he would call the everyday. The Hasidim, as he under, later understood, the, the challenge that they faced was, this, was to serve God in the marketplace. And of course, the average person lives most of the day in the marketplace. Um, and of course, he has a mind in the marketplace, not a fancy modern supermarket, but we push to get the best, best tomatoes at a you haggle over the price of kimchi uh, and the like. Um, and then he was also challenged a few months later by a very famous and well-known um, uh, pastor, actually the father of a confessor of the Kaiser. Hmm. Germany still had an emperor, Kaiser. But he was an evangelical Christian. And, and it was a month before the war broke out, the First World War broke out. Um, and he came to Buber says, you know, it's an exciting moment for you, Jews, because you're going to have it. It's coming where you'll be able to return to the land of Israel, the Messiah's coming. And for us, the second coming, the parousia, the second coming of Jesus. And he started to quote to Buber from the book of Daniel, 
the only apocryphal book that we have in the Hebrew Bible, which suggests apocryphal, apocryphal or apocalyptic literature is characterized by a notion of the birth pangs of Messiah. We'll go for great pain before that great and glorious moment of giving birth. Um, so he's, the Reverend Hill was, I see war coming, but it's only a, a foretaste of, of our redemption. Hmm. The Jewish understanding of redemption and the redemption of the world. And as Buber really, um, accompanied a seldom man, he was still in his late 30s at the time, and this man was already in his mid 70s, this Reverend, he turned to Buber, Buber, do you really believe in God? And Buber, because he's, somehow he sensed that Buber was skeptical about this apocalyptic, triumphal vision. Uh, and Buba mumbles something that says, well, it sounds like yes, but he returned home. He said, why couldn't I say yes? Hmm. Why couldn't I say yes? And he says it occurred to him much later, like a flash. If to speak about God in a third person, God knows that he wants this or thinks this way, I cannot say. But if a God addresses us in the second person, directly addresses us, yes, I do believe. And that led to Buber's philosophy of dialogue. If you wish to see it as mystical, please, but it does certainly a sense of what it means to be uh, in unity with God. Hmm. Um, we can often relate to the world in um, an objective sense. He calls it a, it. This is a microphone. This is a bottle of water near empty. But we tend to often see one another in terms of it, uh, especially in the modern world. Um, this instrumental reason. He's a professor, he's a person according to networking and titles. And you know, you'd refer to me as professor. My my children are told that has been taught that is a dirty word. Hmm. Certainly I'm not. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no, but it means you've of course then we got a much more insidious way we say religious Jew, non religious, Arab, black, green, purple. We tend to obviously um, categorize one another. And but that obviously denies the intrinsic value or worth worth dignity of an individual, um, which is clearly not uh, exhausted or even defined by the external labels that we um, that we uh, ascribe to that mm -hmm. person. And so Buber referred to that as an I-thou relationship. And here I think it's crucial to note the German. Uh, in German, we have two words for personal noun. Uh, one is much more distant and formal. It's called Z. Uh, and that prevails in all relationships other than the most intimate relationships between a parent and a child, between very, very close friends. Um, and that's do, du. It's been translated in English as thou, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Um, but uh, just to capture the weight of that, Buber and Franz Rosenzweig, whom we mentioned before, were very close, certainly in terms of what we know understand Israel as friendship, or the United States, certainly. You become friends with just over a cup of tea or a, or a glass of whiskey, whatever it may be. <laughs> uh, but Buber and Rosenzweig were collaborating in translating the Hebrew Bible into German, working on establishing a new form of, of Jewish education um, and various other projects. And they met quite frequently, even though Rosenzweig was already a very ill man. And the families met, certainly what we would call friendship, and they would still address one another with this formal Z. Hmm. At one point, after having translated um, one of the Hebrew books, the book of Isaiah, into German, Rosenzweig wrote a poem where he inadvertently referred to Buba Purdue. Then he immediately apologized. Oh, sorry, please, please forgive me. And Buba said, no, no, we are now ready. Hmm. After seven years, that do, which you don't hear in English, indicates an achievement of, or the, um, the attainment of mutual trust, where you, your vulnerabilities are, are exposed. Mm. Then you share your vulnerabilities, your fears, your uncertainties, and we all have. Um, I mean, this can think of the image of, of God and Eden, where we were nude, but nudity didn't, <laughs> if you say this metaphorically, then obviously uh, uh, frighten one another. We still embrace one another in love. Once we exited uh, Eden, we have to clothe ourselves. And Buber refers to it as armor. We all 
develop a certain amount of protective uh, postures. Some of us really insist on being called professor mm-hmm. or whatever. Uh, but um, that's protective. And of course, in much more subtle ways, we do protect ourselves than the other. But trust, neutral trust. Now here, the divine enters. Buddha refers to God as the eternal thou. Uh, in reaching out to the other in a fashion that Buba calls dialogical, where we, where we uh, pierce that armor, that veil, uh, and truly affirm the other, confirm the other person mm. in his or her uh, existential dignity, mm. God is addressing us. Uh, what is interesting for Buba and significant, the Hebrew word for faith is emunah, which is translated as trust. Trust. That's the way it's translated in most uh, translations, Jewish translations of the word I know now. Um, and, and just think about that for a moment. It's, God created the world, and behold, it is good. And then pauses. Indeed, very good. Why very good? And the rabbis give a midrash saying the very refers to death, the finitude of life, the fragility of life that we all experience. On many levels, not just death, but the fact that we are finite. And our relationships with others is finite. The people we care about most um, passionately uh, are often uh, subject to pain and, uh, and sometimes un- untimely death. Uh, and that has raised the, obviously the overarching question of uh, biblical faith. We call it the Odyssey, to justify God's judgment, even though we experience life often as fraught with difficulty on all sorts of levels. But God is a source of trust that we have to affirm. Uh, we have to help. Where, as we say in the missile tradition, we are our partners in, in, in the work of creation. Hmm. It's a beautiful midrash by another one's tradition that is noted by several of Buddha's friends. Um, the Hebrew word shalom was derived from the word complete. Shalom is the ultimate glory of creation. But it, we are beckoned to complete, complete that process. Mm. We, certainly the, the children who have been given the Torah, but all of humanity, um, to complete that process. There are many metaphors, sparks that are everywhere, etc. Uh, and Buber draws upon those the, the, that tradition. That there's a spark in you and a spark in you. And that becomes a metaphor for relation, our interpersonal relationships. So if you were to see it as mystical, or as certainly a sense of unity with the ultimate ground of life, the divine, our relationships in the everyday grid of life. Um, and that bears on our relationships with one another, uh, our relationships with our neighbor, our neighbors, uh, especially in the relationship with those who we got as adversaries. I mean, there's real conflict in the world. Um, and we are in conflict with one another, and certainly in conflict with our neighbors. Um, do we just withdraw into the categories of fear, which come under the label of the it objective, seeing our neighbors as, you know, as, as uh, terrorists or anti Semites? That doesn't really help us overcome the adversarial adversary relationships. Um, and that's obviously an extraordinary challenge. Given the simple challenge that Boomer and Rosenzweig had related to one another, mm. seven years of intense until they were able to call uh, each other, yeah, do. right, do or thou. Um, so, in a word, <laughs> it's you want to call it everyday mysticism if you like, but it's certainly uh, a sensibility that there is a higher reality than the one that we experience in the day to day fabric of life with all its difficulties, mm. um, difficulties that. Um, that um, with, in the front of which we earn, we withdraw into our armor, into our self-protective yes. shells. And, yes. Um, in the little book that you mentioned that I've recently published, uh, uh, called, I what's called the yes, <laughs> cultural discontent. Yes. Uh, I, it's a philippic. A philippic means a, an argument against <laughs> uh, defining Judaism in terms of political identities. Um, I don't want to see Judaism as an identity, but as, as um, 
as a as a brit as a kind of covenant mm. um i was very very much this uh, taken aback when you want me to be political not in the referred to the death of a great philanthropist uh, as a jewish patriot judaism is not a question of patriotism and that's i think one of the great difficulties we face here in israel mm. defining judaism in nationalistic terms mm. or questions of identity mm. um, that's all the language of it and it can only um, separate us from the ultimate reality of uh, that is uh, that should be anchored in faith. Hmm. Faith is amuna, um, and trust in God, and uh, and trust that we have a responsibility before God, uh, and that responsibility is in the way we relate to one another, hmm. in the most immediate, most uh, most uh, challenging fashion. Now, relationships with you know, I'm married over 51 years. Imagine that. <laughs> The hero is my wife, though. That she should be interviewed. How she could <laughs> endure me for 21, 51 years, actually, even more, because we obviously were lovers beforehand. <laughs> uh, uh, and you know, I, we have a cat. I, I might come home, the cat always jumps in joy. But sometimes when I come home, I'm you know, in a bad mood. My wife is pre preoccupied. We're all mercurial, go up and down in terms of mood. And, um, and that's obviously the. How to uh, how to attune ourselves? My friend calls it a kind of sacred attunement. How we attune one another, given the fact that we are mercurial and that we are um, given by anxieties, concerns, preoccupations um, that can lead us uh, lead us in a lack of attunement one to the other. Mm. Um, that's a challenge and uh, of, of what we would call the life of dialogue. Mm. Um, and that's been obviously beyond the per interpersonal relationships, so very much, much more, which are the most immediate concerns. It's a relationship with our colleagues, our neighbors, etc. Um, so that's Buka's path to unity. <laughs> Thank you for laying that out for us. I, I feel like you've opened up really many of the great themes that oh. come up in, in the great thinkers, that, and particularly in Madame Buber. Yeah. Um, I'm curious maybe to step back a little before we return to Martin Buber and his dialogical mysticism, which is fascinating and I have plenty of questions. I'm curious first to know, how did you yourself come to become interested in the thought of Martin Buber to dedicate your life to exploring it and unpacking it and teaching the rest of the world about it? Yeah. Bro, it says that all life is fortuitous, you know, accidental moments. Uh, and there's a great poem, you know, life, the path not taken, you know that poem? Yeah, Robert Frost. Yeah, um, and that's only biographically. When you look retrospectively, um, when I first came to Israel, I was seventeen years old, on the edge of you know, towards my eighteenth birthday. I lived in the kibbutz with a group of uh, fellow teenagers, uh, and that was in nineteen fifty-eight, fifty-nine, whatever. Born in nineteen forty-one, so I mean, that's a white back person. Oh. <laughs> I just celebrated my 81st birthday. That's, I still feel like a 16 year old, though. <laughs> <laughs> Any event, um, and my wife was 23 when I married, and I have a granddaughter to be 28. I can't imagine li <laughs> reaching out to a girl 23. I must have been a, a lecture. <laughs> of course, I was considerably younger <laughs> myself. Any event, <laughs> when I was uh, uh, in the kibbutz, we were. We were concerned about what what it means to be a kibbutznik, uh, what what it constitutes, um, the type of relationships that would make that society flourish. And we came across the name Martin Buber, mm -hmm. and we read Iron Vow. We didn't know what we we're talking about, but we went to the chickens call them Vow, the cows Vow, <laughs> one another Vow, not knowing what that meant. But there he was, Buber somehow uh, uh, in the background, um, and then I eventually. Returned to the States, pursued uh, my studies and a doctorate. And I, by chance, I had a teacher who introduced us to um, German social thought, particularly around the issues I mentioned before, the tension between the transition between traditional society to modern society under the rubric of Gemeinschaft, the sense of community. It's translated in Hebrew, Chavruta, mm -hmm. which comes from where we study Torah, creating a sense of community through shared study. Um, bonding with the ultimate for one another. Chavrut, that's a wonderful mm. translation of Gemeinschaft. And Gesellschaft, the, what we was regarded as the invidious world of uh, of modernity. Um, and that struck a chord. Maybe there's something about Buber. 
And so I wrote my doctorate on Buber and German social thought. Buber and his relationship to various German social thinkers. And as I understood, it's leading to his philosophy of dialogue. And once I've directed more than 60 doctorates, doctoral students over the decades, uh, one thing I tell my students is that when you choose a doctoral theme, think of it as a marriage. You know, you want, you know, it would be very difficult to divorce yourself from the theme. So choose a theme that really speaks to you. Mm. Not just like a publicity or a claim as an intellectual, but something that's, that touches your own soul, your own heart. Um, by chance, Buber did touch my heart. Um, and I wrote about other topics, of course, but uh, um, there was a... I, once I, I, my book was published, people turned to me, particularly Martin Buber's son. Buber, I never met Buber, although I had the opportunity, but I didn't know about it. And, but uh, his son, who, took, uh, who was responsible for Buber's um, literary um, um, estate, uh, there's a fancy word we use in the German called Nachlass, when it's left over. <laughs> uh, Sounds like the Hebrew, the Nachlat. Yeah, right. Uh, Buber died in 1965, and his son took over. And his son was eager for someone to advise him. He was well-educated. Well, not well-educated. Well-educated in a German sense. He did his high school education, but nothing more. Um, and he wanted someone to advise him, and I was somehow recommended to him that. Um, as his advisor, and I remained the advisor to the Buber family ever since, um, but literary matters and such. Um, so that drew me, obviously, even deeper into it, um, into my work on Martin Buber. I mentioned that um, in a few months we'll celebrate the 100th anniversary of Ryan Bell, um, and various publishers of Buber's writings are eager to republish it in a more... Uh, uh, um, celebratory fashion, uh, and there are two translations in English, one by a man named Smith, that was 1930s, and then one much later by a man named Walter Kaufman. I've written an introduction to both of <laughs> the new translations, so that it's deeper. Um, I've written, for one of the translations, very detailed annotations. Of course, much, you know, like anyone, you, know, you, write, you write a letter to one another, 50 years hence, you may not what you're referring to. Maybe there will no longer be kimchi in there <laughs> on the culinary uh, uh, network, whatever it may be called, <laughs> or menu. Uh, so you'll have to explain what kimchi was, and it was amongst the leading. Uh, uh, you produce it, cook it, or prepare it? I guess you prepare it. Ferment. Ferment it, okay. So, <laughs> so you have to go into that detail mm -hmm. and see what it meant. Do you have a preference, one or other of those translations? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you allowed to say that publicly? Uh, I actually more or less said that in the introductions. You know? Okay. <laughs> I, tr I correct them in the introduction, uh, translations as well, when we frame back. I like the old, uh, older one where I guess I neglected to say about uh, Val. Um, the second translation was a man who read Buber as a humanist, strictly humanist. It was very easy. This is Walter Kaufman. Yeah. Um, and somehow wasn't attuned to the the religious dimension, the theological dimension, or the mystical, whatever language you wish to use. Uh, so he translated consistently IU, but missing firstly the distinction German has between I, uh, ish and du, ish, I, and du, uh, ish and z. Crucial distinctions for Buber. But what is more crucial, kind of crucial and, and first translation by a man named Smith, who was actually a Presbyterian uh, priest. Uh, understood that when Buber says, when we turn to God, we don't address God ever as Z, but always do. Because there's implicit trust between God and us. And so when Buber says, I do, he's trying, you know, I'm addressing you as a do, but in the same time, I'm also addressing God as God would like us to participate in the healing of the world, um, the completion of the work of, trans of, of creation. Yeah. Uh, and that's very crucial. I mentioned another dimension that's going to be slightly more um, academic. Uh, if you don't forgive me, the microphone will. <laughs> uh, there was a tendency uh, after the First World War, but even first and beforehand, uh, to return to a form of Christianity, early Christianity called Gnosticism. Gnosticism, we know it from the word agnostic, you don't know. Gnosticism in Greek means knowledge. In the sense that there's a higher knowledge than what we have in, 
that is manifest in our everyday existence, even philosophically. So knowledge just says that the world that we live in is, 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 is accidental. Our souls belong to a high reality. The Gnostics, Gnostics say that there's a secret knowledge, arcane knowledge, that once we grasp it, it releases from the incarceration in our bodies, in this awful reality we call uh, uh, terrestrial life. Um, and after the first world, there was this, a sense that we, the world is horrible. We just have to flee it. Uh, and that's called Gnosticism and Neo-Gnosticism. And Bober's Eye and Vow is a very clear scene. No, we can't flee this world. And even through mysticism, as, as a certain type of mysticism, we have to remain in this world because this is God's world. With all its difficulties, uh, on all levels, we have to affirm life as it is. Um, so it is a strong, if you wish, don't allow me to say that, anti-Gnostic impulse in Buber's understanding of the mystic. Uh, and you study Gershom Sholem and others, they are, are certainly alert, alert to. If I understand Luriana Kabbalah correctly, and it's only an if, uh, and the if is important. I was introduced recently as an expert. Experts are not in, 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 in the life of the spirit. Uh, operating a radio or a microphone, it could be an expert. Electricians, but those of us who are engaged in the world of of, ruach, of spirit, there's no expert. It's always a continuous process of self-evaluation, of revision, and the like. Um, any event, the um, Zoriana Kabbalah was were aware of it, especially if you understand it as Gershom Shalom did, that with the expulsion of Jews from from the Iberian Peninsula, where we had a, a glorious, apparently, chapter in Jewish history. Um, and Jewish spiritual history, great poetry, philosophy, all, all the great, um, the grace of, of medieval Jewry was flowered in, uh, in, in the Iberian Peninsula, and then this ignominy, this whole humiliation, suddenly being exiled, crushed. Uh, and according to Rosen's uh, Shalom, and I believe he's reading it carefully, there was a sense of, of the world is painful. Almost a Gnostic acknowledgement, but giving a Jewish answer to the Gnostic questions of the Gnostics, the Holy Sparks. And, and they're found in, in, the, in the, the material world. Uh, there. And we have to re rescue them, release them, and, and return them to their supernal abode in order to truly celebrate life, the world that God created as creation, and as a gift. So. You could be sensitive to the question of Gnosticism, but not take the Gnostic path of fleeing the world, negating the world, but affirming it. And so it's not a naive position that we were speaking about, it's, but the challenge of, of indeed healing the world, uh, healing ourselves in the process, because we're all broken people. We all have a yetzahara, if you, an evil urge, which means a self-centered self urge, need. Uh, we're all narcissistic to one degree or another. Um, and that's even what well, you might say there's healthy narcissism, but that healthy narcissism comes from our friendships and relationships to others, which tell us uh, that they love us. And loving is not an erotic notion, it's simply an affirmation of our individuality, our existential um, dignity, uh, which we often neglect or we're confined to the most intimate relationships, whereas opposed, we don't extend that concern to our neighbors, but they also carry the sparks of the divine. Uh, so maybe that's the mystical dimension. Mm. So Buber is clearly alert to the Gnostic question, but perhaps continuous in some sense with the Ulurianic Kabbalah, as understood by Sholem and others, is that um, the path is not to flee the world, but to remain within it. Um, and so some people refer to Buber's work as everyday mysticism, uh, if you wish. Uh, is there is there a naivete in in that position? I mean, Buber saw so much suffering, so much pain. How does one still go on to affirm the goodness of reality and still come to see the other as a as the locus of divinity, as a thou and not a it? How, how, how do we hold that in today's day and age? I just mentioned uh, beforehand. I just well, we were just discussing who we are, or whatever. I just completed. I think today. Uh, a lecture I'm going to give in Denmark, of all places, on listening. What it means to listen as opposed to hearing. We hear, but don't really listen. 
the challenge of listening to the other. Um, uh, and if you hear, we tend to hear what we want to hear, or we, or we hear it through as free practice for our own understanding. For instance, Buber, uh, had a, um, when he spoke about the, the task of a teacher, or a parent, if you wish, um, which are asymmetrical relationships. You have to have, you have some authority to teach him, just be a friend there. Yeah. The parent also has a certain authority. Um, he developed a notion that our relationship to others cannot be simply empathetic. I feel your pain, your prayer, a pain or your joy. Because uh, uh, empathy tends to project our own feelings on the other people. I know what your pain is because I have the same pain. I have the same celebratory, festive, festive experience because I've had it. But it means you're interpreting the other person's pain or joy or, or autobiographical witness in terms of your own self. Which means you might not really be hearing or listening to what is really the, uh, the other's inner reality. So you develop a concept of inclusion. It goes beyond an empathy to include the other story next to your own and to have, so to speak, an inner dialogue, but not a dialogue of words, not a dialogue of con concepts, but if you wish, a feeling, uh, uh, sensing the, um, the reality of the other as, as, as dignified as your own, um, as existentially as authentic as your own. Um, and what is crucial here is going back to Buba's I and thou, it's not I, thou, I and the and is crucial. I still remain an I, and you still remain a thou. But how do we bridge that divide? Is it a divide that is uh, separates us intractably, or is it a divide that somehow we can reach out one another? So, Buba's notion of inclusion is crucial uh, in our relationships, and you can see it in this reflecting on your relationships that people are most important to you. Uh, their pain. Uh, becomes part of your pain, or at least you're integrated with your own understanding of pain, um, without projecting your own understanding. I should make, make sure I'm consistent here. <laughs> but uh, to let it, so to speak, as a, to let some sort of chorus take place between one another. Um, but what's crucial for Buber is the mutual confirmation of the, the inner reality and dignity existential integrity of the other. Uh, and that is a task, obviously, of learning how to listen to the other. Um, it's not easy, not at all easy, because you tend to obviously be preoccupied with your own understanding, your own, and you project one another. You don't really listen to one another in the deepest sense. Um, and, anyway, I can <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to think about, about these, these are beautiful ideas. And their ideas which have the power to, to move us and change the way we see ourselves, others in the world around us. I'm curious, as an intellectual historian, not to revert back to labels here, but um, where, where has been Buber's reception in contemporary thought? Where, have, have there been communities that have taken on his thinking as their own? Or has, has he perhaps been neglected and, and left behind in academia? Where, where do you see him, his ideas living today? Well, I'm an academic, I think he still speaks, but just by chance, purely by chance, this evening, <laughs> I'm, to, I'm, I'm to address a, a Jewish film festival in, film festival in uh, Copenhagen hmm. by Zoom. Somebody's going to pick me up soon. Um, so that's going to be a 9.30 hour time. <laughs> the film was made several years on Buber, Buber and Israeli youth. Uh, um, addressing the question is, do, does, do Israelis hear Buber? It turns out there are very sort of groups of young, of young, young people in their twenties, early thirties, who see themselves as acolytes, followers of Buber, in various ways. Um, uh, so, <laughs> introduced the film. Uh, they asked me to introduce the film, mm -hmm. and then afterwards, open it up to dialogue between all the Danes who are interested in Jewish films. I don't know, <laughs> whoever. Uh, and that's what's perhaps most important, not just how academics see it, because. You know, you're being pushed to write, pu publish, and so you choose a topic maybe you don't really care about it. But you have it. Well, this might be acceptable to the, the, the referees and read my article and I get clapped. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's, it's 
the academic world has become very commercial. Mm. And in the press sense, you publish or perish. Uh, and, and now they even have grand rankings of journals. If you publish in this journal, you get three points. This journal, seven points. This one, there. <laughs> so it's a very vicious world of academics today. Publish or perish. Um, and it, it does somehow distort the life of spirit, um, as I have sought to indicate before. Um, but the real, I think, uh, uh, answer to the question you raise is not so much academic. There are lots of articles on Boober and endless uh, books, etc. cetera. Um, but how its message has been, uh, has stamped, if you wish, the thinking of of ordinary individuals who thoughtful, caring individuals. Mm. Um, and I, I believe it does, not, maybe, not like a volume that I personally would like, but, <laughs> but certainly it's, it's not, it's not, um, he's not been forgotten. Mm. There used to be a thing still, stamps of people, right wing Israelis, Kahana Sadak, Kahana was right. I understand in Tel Aviv, there's stamps, Boobo <laughs> Sadak. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. Nice. You may you may yourself had a small role to play in, in allowing his thought to continue on to as no, you uh, I've actually uh, maybe one of the books that uh, Martin Boobo's son asked me to put together was his writings on the Arab question. And he published some sixty or seventy essays on how we are to relate to the Palestinians. And that was called I gave it a title, Land of Two Peoples. That's just been translated into Arabic. Mm. Uh, and I, on the, another little book I did is on in Arabic and Hebrew, Fas and Fas, one side Hebrew, and, uh, that was many years ago, and Buba on peace and and, fa and fraternity, Buba al Shalom v'Achvat Amin in Hebrew, um, and that's perhaps even more interesting. I think oh, about six months ago I was approached by a, a former leading member of the PLO, a very militant uh, member of the PLO. Uh, just his family was fled Jerusalem, not far from where living we are now, and he was raised in, in Cairo, and then became a, a leading militant figure, a figure in, in the more militant uh, wing of the uh, PLO, and he even said he did a doctorate in Texas, in fact, in Austin, Texas, perhaps I think, and he had a neighbor who was an Israeli, he refused, he said, I, I can't stand it, I can't get to move me in my office. They didn't want to get near Jews. Turns out his parents were able to return, um, and his mother was very ill. Returned to Jerusalem, um, and King Hussein asked the Israeli Prime Minister at the time, I believe, to give this gentleman twenty-four uh, hours permission to enter Jerusalem to see his mother before she passed away. And he went to Hadassah. He saw Jewish doctors caring for his mother in an honorable fashion. Couldn't get, get over it. And that repeated itself on every occasion. And he developed a, a, const, a notion of what he calls, rec, well, Arabic word for moderation leading to reconciliation. He eventually returned, he had a PhD in political science. He returned to uh, Jerusalem, taught at Al Quds University, which is a Palestinian university. And with his own money, he took 27 students to Auschwitz, Palestinian students, mm. just to understand. Uh, the existential reality of the Jews. He was expelled, his home was put on fire, his home, he had to flee for a couple of years, he was returned. Uh, and he contacted me because he feels that uh, Buber has something to say to the Palestinian people. He, he suggested a film on Buber in Arabic that would be shown in the Abu, du, Abu Dhabi fil, Arabic Film Festival. And we're working on that now. Oh, fascinating. So, fascinating story. <laughs> so it's, it's not dead, so to speak. Mm. <laughs> Uh, it's obviously a drop in the, in the yes. bucket, but um, but that's where buckets are filled up mm -hmm. with drops. <laughs> <laughs> drops. Well said. Well said. <laughs> well said. Okay. I'm I'm curious. With there's been there's been some scholarship, including your own, on the transition from Buber's earlier, more monistic mysticism, perhaps, and his works like Daniel and, and his where he recounts his own mystical experience and his work, as you mentioned, in the Static Confessions, which is beautiful literary work mm -hmm. towards later what we were discussing his dialogical mysticism mm -hmm. one which seems to have more place for, for the other and for ulteriority in yeah. in that relationship right i'm curious i'm curious both and, and you began to mention 
about the individual that came to consult with Buber and, and took his life the next day, and Buber felt that his philosophy was inadequate if it wasn't addressing the, the real questions. I'm, I'm curious both if you could speak a bit more to that transition from what's seen as his earlier phase to his latter phase of, of dialogue, and, and what perhaps are the real differences between the two phases. Right. You know, there's seeds, even in his earlier life, um, about the, the nature of um, interpersonal relations. In the, in the biography I wrote of Buber, which um, is now just appeared in German and soon in Hebrew, um, I place a great deal of focus on his relationship to his mother. When he was three years old, his mother left him and his father without bidding him farewell. She just fled and now knows that she eloped with a Russian. She was an actress, and obviously led her to perhaps romantic escapades. But in any event, she left him and he turned to the window and she to say, Ma, and then Ma never returned. Mm. He left a deep scar towards the end of his life. He died at the age of 87. He still recalled that scar. Um, uh, and that, I believe, in retrospect, um, led him to be sensitive to the nature of relationships. Relationships were not fulfilled. As a child, he was sent to, um, to be raised by his father to his paternal grandparents, who were pious Jews. Uh, and they didn't know how to address this question, Mom, where's my mom? And they didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, and he was left alone. He claims the first relationships he had were with with cats and dogs, and, and on that particular horse, they responded to him. Our human beings somehow were distant. Uh, that only suggested that the quest for relationships that are secure. His own, um, this, and I do mention the biography, when he um, uh, finally had a relationship with a woman who was a bit older and not Jewish. Um, and she reached out to him. She was a liberated woman in terms of her background, liberated sexually, romantically, erotically, as well as intellectually. Uh, and she reached out to Boomer, a, a frightened former little yeshiva student. You might appreciate that. <laughs> Timid. Uh, she introduced him to the world of, uh, of relationships, which are intimate. And the first letter in which he writes to her, accepting her love, he concludes by saying, now I know what I've been looking for, a mother. Mm -hmm. Imagine getting a lover like that. Would, you, would that work on you? <laughs> but she understood what he meant, a trusting, warm, nurturing. There's a wonderful word in German, which is somehow related to the notion of birth called Geborgenheit, which I translated in English, it means security, warmth, as such as you experience in the womb. Actually, now I value, you'll see that he writes about that. Mm -hmm. um, it, what he calls the innate you, is in the womb of a, a, a one's mother, and then you're sent out to the world. For he calls it the reality principle. Ah, um, where are you? <laughs> uh, a, a maternal love, um, if you wish to call it that. Um, and that maternal love for the mystics was somehow not to be experienced in this fraught world we call. <laughs> uh, um, instrumental relationships, the problematic, the mercurial relationships of, of one another, where there's tension, war, anger, uh, uh, the manipulative life of networking, which is very much characteristic of the university. My colleagues will forgive me for that, <laughs> but it is, it is a very invidious world where you establish relationships not based on you really have something in common, but because it will help you in terms of career. And the like. Um, so that motherhood was found, and it had an expression of mysticism, the great mother mm -hmm. beyond the world that we live in. Um, so if you wish to see it by, uh, in biographical terms, uh, that um, that maternal warmth of what determined German's Geborgenheit is where it were challenged um, to see within our relationships. And for Buber, that was inscribed in his understanding of Judaism. Uh, we have a technical term in, in Judaism which can distinguish biblical faith, Jewish faith, from other faith uh, uh, um, um, impulses or directions. We call it creationism. Jews ultimately celebrate Maaseh Breshit, the acts of creation. 
And thus we have a simple, it's a string of the simple, the chayim, <laughs> to life. Um, and that obviously has a theological, <laughs> theological inflection set. Good old Tommy Spiegel said, if we only have bigger Balkanheim to secure relationships to one another, the field of the world is really our home. Uh, is in the here and now. Um, and they were challenged to make the here and now. Indeed. Um, <laughs> so, in a word. <laughs> uh, it, it it seems that um, it seems that Buber was the the prophet of a uh, very imminent, a very day to day, a very sort of relationship or, or mysticism that was in relationships in the, in the daily, and he may have been a reluctant prophet, as as you write, that uh, the whole the whole image of, of the Buber with with the, with the beard and the whole prophetic um, stature may have actually just been something of a a, a mask for him. Yeah, no, he actually tells a story that <laughs> he. Uh, when he was born, there was a, a, a birth defect, a lower lip that was twisted. And given his sense of loneliness, uncertainty, who he was, who was not a very masculine male, he was, you know, frail, and he was only less than five foot two. He was a tiny man. Uh, and all that gathered around him this uncertainty. And so as soon as he was able to grow a mustache, he did. And it wasn't sufficient to cover up the the, beer, the lower lip, so he grew a beard. Mm. Uh, and he said, people would think of me as a prophet, but it's only because I wanted to cover up mm. that embarrassing with lower lip. <laughs> it's a, it, but he said, it seemed, it seemed to be appealing, I kept it. It's an interesting <laughs> anecdote because in the Jewish tradition, there was another prophet who had a speech impediment yes, and he went on to take us out of Egypt. Right. Sometimes, sometimes it's our own frailties and weaknesses and insecurities right. that thrust us into... Yeah. I had another discussion recently, I forgot what context, but one of these things as well. <laughs> <laughs> Leadership, oh yeah, our charisma. To, uh, was a, with an eye and valve, has a great, uh, stunning critique of, of so-called charismatic leadership, hmm. um, which um, engaged many in his time. Um, 1921 was the 100th anniversary of the death of, of uh, Napoleon. And the Germans said, we need a, now we need a leader like Napoleon. Hmm. Uh, and the term was coined by Max Weber. You heard him, the sociologist. Charisma comes from the Greek word for 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 grace. But means grace for us. And somebody who has we can see is divinely sent to us. And that's what we call charismatic leadership. Napoleon and the Germans eventually turned to a man called Hitler. And Buber and Einstein really prescient, insightfully notes this is not what we want. Mm. This is dangerous. And I mentioned that in that context, uh, in the modern world, where the image is very important, how you protect your voice, you have, uh, how you're seen, Moses would never have made it. Yes. <laughs> that would be a leader. <laughs> and yet he wasn't here. Hmm. <laughs> and that's obviously the, the danger of, uh, of, uh, of modern technology and the way we protect ourselves hmm. is having credibility hmm. and leadership. Hmm. Uh, and that's obviously... One of the more uh, one of the more immediate problems of of, um, of uh, modernity. Just think about that. Um, I'm clear. I know I'm, I'm I'm on the left, but that, I know these terms I think are really helpful. I wrote an article on uh, um, getting rid of these languages of right and left and just some some on decency. What is a decent? Mm. What's a decent way of engaging the political mm. world as opposed? Mm. These labels don't help us, hmm. but very crucial in terms of uh, uh, the way we mention it, public here. Matinho, he speaks very, he's eloquent, he has a mellifluous voice, a very beautiful voice, as opposed to uh, others, but that can lead us astray. Hmm. Uh, and we have to be cautious about it, but the modern world, obviously, um, by the very nature of technology, if you're, photog if you're photogenic or not, you have a beautiful voice, uh, you, you speak. You speak smoothly. Uh, yeah. It's interesting these these alternative um, models of leadership. Yeah. I um, if I could share a, a short uh, anecdote. There was, there's a story told. Rameir Shapiro, who built the Shiva Schachmi Lublin before the war and, and began the study of Dafyomi, he was a chassid of the Chartgiver Rebbe, yeah. and the Chartgiver, when he was speaking at the opening of the Shiva, asked why the Torah was given through through Moses, through 
and, and not someone like May Shapiro, who was an eloquent public speaker. Mm -hmm. And he says, because if Moses was an eloquent public speaker, people could just say, the skeptics would say that Moses just came and he just wooed the crowds with these great speaking, mm -hmm. but because he could, you know, he, he was, <laughs> they could barely hear him and it was hard for him to put a sentence together. It must've been that there was some truth and some, some wisdom that they had in his words. So I, pre I very much appreciate the alternative uh, mode of leadership that you're presenting. And it seems very clear that you've, I, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but you've had some sort of eye-thou eye encounter with Buber throughout your life. Although you, you say you never met him physically, it seems like you've met him plenty in a really Possibly. deep way. Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> and uh, I very much appreciate you sharing that with us within the constructs and the confines of institutions and, right. um, and they, be they political and institutional and economic and this is all being right. produced on all kinds of platforms. Hopefully mm -hmm. we can break through and be able to touch each other and, and reach out I'll to the good. audience in a real way. Thank you so much. And again, if you want something to be recorded, recorded or elaborated, please. Okay. I look forward to meeting you in the, in the, in the marketplace. In the, in the real marketplace. In the, in, the, in the real world. I also want to mention while we're still recording that these microphones were donated to the project by Chazi Spear from Jerusalem Design. And uh, if anyone has any interior or exterior design needs, commercial or private, they should reach out to Chazi. Okay. Thank you for so generously giving me your time. <laughs> was there any was there any final thoughts or things that you'd like to add? Something that you felt that we may have missed? Uh, I would have to hear it again. <laughs> yeah, I just have to send a message. That, yes. Is there anything that you would like me to, to uh, elaborate since I have a little bit more time? Hmm. Well, I don't know about elaborating, but I will say I really appreciated what you said about how we should turn Judaism into a nationalist identity. That we should. We should not. Right. Yeah. I really appreciated that. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the, the tendency. Yeah. What What might Judaism be otherwise? What's What's a positive and affirmative affirmation of what Judaism could be? Well, I think I, you know. Uh, uh, I mentioned I wrote a little book called uh, Cultural Disjunctions. It's based on post, what we call post-traditional. I don't like the word identities, but that's what they wanted. Anyway, I don't like the word identity. But, but, um, it's clear for those who are still within the, uh, firmly anchored in the tradition uh, that it's, Judaism is a life of prayer and Torah study. Um, those who reside find themselves beyond those boundaries, still may be attached to the, pre the tradition, uh, have to, are challenged to find new ways of expressing Judaism as a spiritual vocation. Um, um, and I seek to outline that possi those possibilities in the book. Mm -hmm. how, we, um, how we still can be, well, another aspect of this, as I open up, we're no longer simply Jews. We read, you know, <laughs> The wisdom of other nations. And I Val, it's not a Jewish book. Buber mentions only three Jews. Jesus, Paul, and and and, and uh, Peter. They're in the New Testament. But he mentions far more extensively Buddhist figures. Taoists are very much influenced by Taoism. Um, so as that's typical of a modern individual. We're exposed to various testimonies of uh, of various cultures, various ways of understanding the challenge of being a human, the challenge of trying to understand what life is, with all its its difficulties and contradictions, um, and there are these painful contradictions. Obviously, the fact that there's life and there's death, um, there's youth, and some of us don't go beyond youth. Um, there's war. There's hatred. Uh, I may not spell it out. <laughs> sure. Um, um, so we draw as mountains in the very nature of where aren't first we're speaking English right <laughs> it draws upon it as what we call cultural memory cultural memory that, that is that um, is, is inflected in English um, that, uh, that palpitates in English um, many of us speak several languages I, I speak German and, and Yiddish and Hebrew of course my wife speaks eight languages. Mm, well. <laughs> uh, she's a direct descendant of Spinoza, which makes it even more on yeah. both sides of the family. Well, <laughs> so she has, kind of, but she speaks eight uh, lang uh, languages, eight languages separately. She speaks others, but 
Anyway, it's open to a whole bunch of. <laughs> uh, so, how do you integrate uh, what you might call our cosmopolitan reality with uh, that is still significantly Jewish? And that's, I try to suggest, it's still a spiritual vocation. And the challenge is even the greatest since we're in the state of Israel. It's a political identity. There's a political reality that, that defines us as Jews, that engages us as Jews. So uh, it's even more difficult here. So what's uh, the solution on one foot? One foot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I do have a chapter on uh, learning study, Torah study. Hmm. There's a beautiful, uh, you heard of Moses Mendelssohn? And he wrote a book called in Jerusalem, where everyone focuses on his definition of revelation. But he has a much more significant uh, uh, passage beforehand. And this is very telling. Man is in the 17th, 18th century. He says, with the, uh, with the advent of publishing, published books, you get a book, and you go home and read it alone. Whereas traditional Torah is you have to study it together by a very nature community, and you discuss the books together. Uh, we mentioned the term chavruta, and that's an interesting way in Yiddish you refer to as a synagogue, as you perhaps know, shul, which means a school. School. <laughs> that's because Torah study is integral to Jewish prayer. Uh, it's sometimes called a bet midrash And a bet midrash can be sometimes in the same room as the, where you pray. Uh, so I, I suggested re, recentering Judaism and Torah. Mm -hmm. uh, here I draw a lot on Franz Wolzenstein, who said that he was the returning to Franz Wolzenstein, who was raised as an assimilated Jew. At some point in his life, it became important to to, um, to integrate his life, to reintegrate his life into uh, into Judaism, uh, and Torah study became important to him. And he created a, a type of school, a translation in German from the into German from the Hebrew word Bet Midrash, and German is Lehaus. Um, but there he said, all questions are kosher, because we come from different, we read Max Weber, we read Freud, uh, uh, whoever, we, whoever we read, Shakespeare. Uh, have you written the book yet? No, yeah, one day you will, if, if you feel like it. There must be books that you really like reading, though. That's right, say. So, and they have questions that are raised. Uh, or questions to help uh, you to articulate your own experience and feelings and concerns. All those questions are important, but let the letter to Torah address those questions. And that becomes sort of a dialogue between the tradition and the questions that mm -hmm. we all carry as moderns, mm -hmm. willy nilly as moderns. Um, so that's what I mm -hmm. try to explore in the book. Mm -hmm. And then the question of faith. I, uh, you know, this book of the Little, the Little Prince? You know, the Little Prince is presented as a child's book, but it's really addressed in adults. Adults have, um, have forgotten how to be children. They have lost their innocence. They're always suspicious of our sick. We become skeptical. Uh, so I have a chapter on uh, a Little Prince uh, as leading us to, uh, to once again be children. That mm -hmm. is to say, children in the sense of innocent questions. Uh, or to acknowledge our, those questions that we now flee or, mm. or, or package in, in academic language, which really, uh, 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 can I use a fancy word? Sure. <laughs> Emasculates those questions, eviscerates them, um, loses their, the flame, the original flame of, uh, that child brings to, to, to the questions mm. of, of life. I'm curious. I haven't had the pleasure of knowing you over the years, but this childishness that you're speaking about in, in extolling, is this something that you've had through the years or is this something that you've come back to? Uh, I think towards the I'm end? still an adolescent. <laughs> <laughs> right, anyway. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful spirit. It's okay. a beautiful spirit to carry. Welcome, indeed. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Good luck to you, Bob. Thank you very you're much. You're welcome to respond. Thank you so, <laughs> so much. my door. <laughs> Thank you.